Krishnamurti talks in some of his videos about thinking together, which is just as it sounds, which is not about somebody saying something while the other person is agreeing, disagreeing, judging, but actually thinking together at the same time. And he also talks about you have to do it, you have to actually see it. So with the stuff that I've been saying to myself, they're things that I actually see. It's not something, it's not something that I came up with through intellectualization, even though it sort of appears that way by talking about it. And it's through the endomimetic and epimimetic process where something just sort of flashes in my mind and I can write it down. And it's not from association. And he also talks about what are we going to do together to create a good society. And he says we need to think together. Yet it seems to be the most difficult thing. I guess I'm just wondering if anyone will be able to think together with what I was saying and some of this stuff. Meaning actually thinking with it versus thinking, oh, that's true, that's not true, yeah, that makes sense, no, that makes no sense. That's not actually thinking, it's it's judging, which is blocking it. It's not seeing. So, yeah. I also had an insight that perception as learning as energy, as perception gives energy to really understand something, to learn something, to see something new actually see it, not take in words intellectually. That's what rewires the brain. And that clear perception is needed for that energy. And that energy is what actually rewires the brain and sort of creates that perception mirrored in the brain. That could be how I think I talked about how in manic consciousness there's like an imprint and that's how we can sort of go back and harvest our mania. We haven't really wired those things into reality so much but they're there imprinted creating a greater context through which to understand things and that's how I actually feel like moving forward one who goes through that process can actually have access to this learning insight energy perception process more easily because the foundation the context has been laid as an imprint probably from being in that high energy state and I think that's partly what causes brain growth and neuroplasticity because I talked about it too as it seems like it's this other brain growth or reactivating the atrophied neural pathways that we had as children and how they talk about oh, oh what's unnecessary is pruned well I think what is pruned is what is designed by society to be pruned I actually feel like it's possible with autism that by not having access to words so much, it allows those other areas of the brain to stay and not get pruned. And then the words can be sort of added on top of that, slowly but surely, but it ensures those other dimensions of sensitivity and, and intelligence don't get pruned away. And I was thinking about how in that state of manic consciousness, There is a sense of beauty a lot of the time. And there's a sense of perception of seeing and understanding and making meaning and learning. 
and a lot of it feels beautiful. And I'm wondering if how they talk about goodness, truth, and beauty, if, if beauty and love are part of perception in, in a way, like that state of love is necessary for perception, and love is beauty as well. And so they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but maybe the process of perception itself is beauty. Whether something is felt as, oh, that's beautiful or not. I have the sense that the process of perception is beauty itself. And that perception is a thing of beauty. And in a way, the universe has created human beings, which are beautiful creatures who can perceive beauty. And as beautiful creatures, we can unfold as beauty, or we've been trained to unfold as something else. And that's why I think language and thought and the ego is a virus. Our software has been infected by word viruses and it's totally screwing up our hardware. It's almost like the word viruses of the ego are what supposedly prune the brain but really it just makes most of the brain go offline because we're intellectualizing and conceptualizing and abstracting about reality instead of being one and sensitive to reality. The abstracting process actually prevents the sensitivity. So those word viruses actually just keep those brain circuits going of those words, which is very, very limited when you consider the entire brain structure. And it blinds us too. We can't see past our own ego, image, memory, thought complexes. So I feel like the word viruses that we take in actually just make most of our brain and sensitivity unavailable to us. But it seems necessary in a way because we've created such a insensitive world that if we were sensitive to it, we would probably act like autistic children. And I think they're trying to tell us, hello, you have to design the world differently because we can barely stand this crap. And that's a huge percentage of the next generation. And it's for people's best interest too that don't have that sensitivity because they still do have the sensitivity, but their mind is able to intellectualize things away and that could be what's causing a lot of the physical ailments by by intellectualizing things away our body is taking the brunt of it and there's all these chronic diseases and things going on so and we don't know what's causing it well it could be all the noise it could be all the chemicals it could be everything that is not natural and it's the unnatural ego that's able to brush it off and, and be blind to what's happening. And I have a sense that emotions are energy bouncing off thoughts. And then if there's a certain thought structure that's particularly strong, the energy, if something similar comes in that's perceived, there's like this big reaction from all these accumulated recordings of incidences around that, which one takes personally. And then it prevents us from seeing. It's well known that when a person's emotional, they can't think straight, they can't see straight. I was also thinking, what is the habitat of this neuro tribe? So the neuro tribe of omnipolarity, what is our habitat? 
It's difficult to function in the way society's structured. I came across this website that is bipolar-neurodiversity.com. There's not that much about it, but it says, what's this about? Bipolar people naturally have rhythms that go up and down. In an upstate, bipolar people tend to be feel expansive, engaging, creative, full of life. In a downstate, we integrate rest and hunger down. The sleep, temperature, and social needs of bipolar people vary a great deal depending on whether we are high or low. We tend to be creative, loving, sensitive creatures. Our needs change frequently, which can be a blessing as it leads to sophisticated attunement. Approached as a mindfulness practice, living bipolar is a beautiful thing. And there's a quote, sensitivity and intelligence, the combination will make you crazy, but that's what separates you from the rest of the bastards and makes you worth talking to. Nick Nelson. So along with that, it's like, how do we design a life where that works? Because if one is down and one has to go to work and one can't go to work, it's difficult to work nine to five. And I talked about before how it'd be good for people to be project-based or you know, get this done in the next two months. Like, I don't care how and when, just that's your task. Or get something done or get a number of things done. That would be more in alignment with people that have these other biorhythms. I think it's like a biorhythm of the universe. It's not the rhythms of the programmed ego. When that is scrambled and, and decoupled from, it's difficult to actually go by the structured clock of society. It's more about moving with the universe and how the universe wants one to move within the particular universe that one finds oneself in. And I'm seeing it could also be trying to get one out of the universe that one has created into one that's more coherent for a person with the biorhythms of the universe and a person that is able to create a different lifestyle design according to those biorhythms is going to change the fabric of the universe ever so slightly it's going to have more people dropping out of the structure of society. And I feel like co-creation and collaboration comes in here because we have some really good ideas about visionary stuff and it would take more than just one person to be able to move forward with some of it. So it's important to harvest one's skills and assets and decide that one is going to use them for the greater good. If one has housing and enough money for food and the basic necessities of life, then what's the difference of using one's skills and assets to change the world or just sitting and watching TV all day? One's going to be more rewarding than the other and could lead to things that do have some source of income at some point, but we don't really know. I think that's part of it. It's about co-creating in the spirit of love and seeing what comes out of it, not, oh, this is my plan and I'm going to do this, 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 and I'm going to get that. That's just part of the framework of society. And I guess that's another level with this self-dialogue is what I really would like to invite is collaboration on visions. Embodying one's manic self to carry out one's visions. And I feel like if we were able to co-create different aspects of society designed particularly for the omnipolar neurotribe, for that neuro-reemergence, 
then that would shift the whole society. And maybe the whole society doesn't have to shift. Maybe it's just about people with the trans consciousness being able to create an environment that is suitable to them to be able to actually survive and to not go so up and down because if the environment is suitable then maybe there won't be so many ups and downs but I feel like the ups and downs are because one tries to fit oneself back into society so one goes back into visionary consciousness and then one goes through the scary hallucinations then goes into a depression and whatever it's like if we're just our creative selves and in the right environment then and actually talking with each other in these ways as opposed to oh you're bipolar too oh let's connect over our emotional pain it's, no like we can be co-creators and collaborators I think this trans consciousness experience is like a wisdom tradition of the universe it's done this since the beginning of humanity I'm sure plunged us into the depths and expanses of consciousness in order to allow us to learn to to see what learning is it's not about learning anything in particular it's about being restored to learning and this is a time when humanity needs to start learning again for itself by actually seeing for itself not just learning from what others say is knowledge and I do like the term that is against my neurocircuitry that is against my rewiring that is against my emergent neuroplasticity and I was thinking about visualization and I actually don't have the capacity to visualize really I don't see any images in my head but I was thinking about how they talk about the brain doesn't know the difference between visualizing shooting hoops and shooting hoops and people that do one or the other often perform quite similarly in the final test of actually shooting hoops for real so somebody that just visualized it it's like one shooting hoops and then I realized by perhaps talking to myself all the time this way it's not visualizing but it's it's communicating it's talking about it in this way it could actually be creating that as a framework in my brain because the brain doesn't necessarily know the difference between me talking about it in this way and it actually being so so if I was to if I found somebody that I could actually talk to about this all the time in this way that would make it so and perhaps one day if I go into a bit of a crisis and I'm able to talk through it that will be able to transform it and perhaps doing the self dialogue with myself is a good precursor to making that so in reality I feel like talking to myself in self-dialogue could actually be similar to visualization in that way so it's like I'm visualizing this all the time for myself every day and I also am thinking now that it's similar to affirmation and they say affirmations work to a certain extent but I'm not repeating one affirmation like I'm not bipolar I'm magical or something I'm saying thousands of affirmations and I would think that's more powerful than just actually repeating one affirmation so I could repeat one affirmation or I could say a thousand things that are affirming what it is that I want my reality to be which is usually what affirmations are for as well is saying something that we want to be true and saying it like it's true now well I'm talking about this context in the same way this is true now for me I have experienced other stuff but I'm in the process of drowning it out and I think if each one of us did that for ourselves drown out that other context 
have it there if it's absolutely necessary, which it's, it's quite necessary right now. But the more we drown it out, it's possible the less and less necessary it will become. Because imagine I go into distress on the street tomorrow and somebody has this context, this way of seeing. They're going to receive me differently than if they don't. And so that's going to change things. So I'm starting by talking to myself about it. And I feel that's pretty powerful for myself. But it's still, if I went into distress for some reason, I would have nobody else with that context to come here and receive me and have a dialogue about it. I have a friend I could call on the phone. I have maybe one other thing I could call. So the context I'm creating with myself might protect me to a certain extent. It might actually prevent other thoughts arising that would get freaky, that would move me towards the context that I don't want to participate in, which is mental illness. So it could prevent that. Or if I did get distressed, I might be able to allow other contexts to arise to counter the context of, oh my gosh, I need mental illness help or whatever. Or I might be able to communicate differently to somebody that does encounter me to keep me safe. Might be able to say, just be validating, just be affirming, just be unconditionally loving, just be non-judgmental, you know, just stay with me, just allow this to happen. And so, it's hard to say. And that's, I think, partly where ECPR comes in, is that I know that I know that that would be a helpful context. But also for me to creating this context for myself in self-dialogue is a type of herd immunity. And I talked about that before. They talk about herd immunity. Well, this is herd as in hearing. My hearing will be immune to other contexts that might want to come in and pathologize me. I think I always have been immune to some extent. Like I never did really believe it. But I accepted that help because there's nothing else. And that's where designing alternatives like that book on my own talks about. That would be one of the things to co-create together would be alternatives to the dominant paradigm. And it's one thing to think, oh, let's create a respite center. But I feel like each one of us could be a respite center for others. Not necessarily needing a building, but having that context within our heart to witness somebody through their process. And the way we speak creates new genes and new neural networks. It's part of the perception. Perception gives the energy to create a mirror of that which it perceived. So if, if it's the ego linear process, that's just going to get reinforced over and over again. Or we have words, we use words to get pleasure, dopamine. And this is how our words, our repetitive thoughts, turn us into bio machines because those repetitive thoughts are tied into our repetitive behaviors of our repetitive habits. And then we're basically bio machines. And the term spiritual emergence is quite popular with these experiences and I've said that I don't know if I would identify with spiritual the very first time it felt very spiritual for me and since then it's felt less and less spiritual because I think I've gotten used to it it only f was interpreted as feeling spiritual because of the otherness to my regular experience which is still spiritual which is fine and I kind of like the term neuroemergence, and I made that up because it's sort of like the emergence of a new neurotribe. It's, it's sort of 
the emergence of new perceptions which are tied into the brain and neural networks so it's like actually part of the brain coming back online and when we put it in those terms it doesn't seem so airy fairy it seems like whoa like capacities of the brain are actually reawakening we already had these capacities as children so i feel part of my goal if i have a goal is to develop psychological safety for neuroemergence for these other sensitivities of the brain to turn back on these different lines of intelligence are being suppressed and i think that's one of the reasons why children are being born with autism because humanity can't argue with that and these other lines of intelligence are going to develop through the autistic children but again of course science wants to say that there's something wrong with these children i think they're sort of the answer to what's wrong with humanity they likely will not be allowed to flower into that and to be seen as the solution i can't imagine that happening but it's pretty obvious that they are and the question is will we love them if we love them unconditionally they're going to flower into the geniuses that they are if we don't they're going to be turned into exactly what we judge them as and they're children so it's up to us to make that choice will we see all the capacities they do have and will we see all the capacities that they will have if we love them the way that is necessary and it's the same with people that go through trans consciousness or neuroemergence interpreted as mental illness a lot of times family members can't unconditionally love the person and the person actually needs to be provided open space to re-explore, rediscover, recreate who they are, not recover back into who the family remembers them to be. It's like a blank slate in a way. And I talked about Dr. David Lukoff and how his family really allowed him to explore and he went through the experience without ever being diagnosed with anything and that rarely happens so when a family perceives their loved one with the eyes of now my loved one is mentally ill it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy because they're going to always be perceiving them in terms of well you're not who you were if you're not acting like who you were before that means you're getting worse like it's it's all a bunch of crap I also thought of bipolarity or omnipolarity as a natural resource that state of consciousness is a resource for lots of visions ideas information insights and it's not being utilized and harvested that way it's also a new resource for new neural networks and new perceptions and new perceptions are needed for new behaviors and we definitely need new behaviors and new ways of being as human beings it's a type of perceptio diversity one thing people probably don't like about people with bipolar is that they call out people's so they can see right through everything that's why i like the idea of chief disturber i came across in a book that in Africa they only have one word for speak, sing, and dance. And I think that's pretty profound. 